when they can select the topics in the infectious disease area when we're trying to bring everything together. Right? Well, thank you. It's a really wonderful opportunity to give you a series of 11 clinical lectures to try to tie all this together. Uh, see the class has thinned out a little bit. I will try to uh, indicate to you that the things which are, may or, uh, be on your examination and try to reward those of you who attend the lectures uh, with uh, a few pointers about what may or may not be on the exam. And please do feel free to ask me questions about, uh, as we go along, if you, if you have uh, uh, issues or, or uh, questions to bring up. Today we're going to sort of give an overview of infectious diseases, about pathogenesis, of some of the diagnostic uh, approaches to infectious diseases, uh, and also we're going to cover some highlights of the various uh, bacteria that you've been looking at. We're not going to really touch about the viruses so much in most of these lectures, but we'll, we'll touch about some of the uh, bacteria. What do you see in this uh, slide? Excuse me? Excuse me? Somebody, how many of you see the arrow? How many of you don't see the arrow? Raise your hand if you see the arrow. Half of you see the arrow, about a third of you see the arrow, and about two-thirds of you don't see the arrow, correct? Once you have, uh, once you've seen the arrow, you'll, you'll never see the FedEx again. That's the arrow. How, how many of you see the arrow now? The point of this is an old uh, mo in clinical medicine. We see what we look for, and we look for what we know. We see what we look for, and we look for what we know. So we're going to see a lot of things, and you've been seeing a lot of things, and the idea is that once you see that, you look for it, and you'll say, aha. It's very difficult to see something if you don't know that it's there. One incidental aspect about this slide is what color is that? Blue or purple, right? And what color is this? Red. I'm going to talk about gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And in some of the slides I'm going to show, you may have some trouble with the colors. But if it's blue or purple, it's gram-positive. And if it's red, it's gram-good. Now, infectious diseases uh, were really the major conquest of the 20th century. At the turn of the 20th century, uh, infectious diseases, as you probably know, were the major cause of death. Indeed, in uh, most areas of the United States, infections represented nine of the top ten causes of death. And that was dramatically reduced to the point that by uh, the 1960s, people were saying that infectious diseases are going to vanish as major uh, causes of, of death. Now we know there's a lot of increasing concern about infectious diseases, new pathogens, the HIV AIDS epidemic, the appearance of drug-resistant bacteria, the possibility of pandemic influenza due to novel strains, and the list uh, goes on and on. So that has been reversed to some extent. And as you sit at your desk, infectious diseases are a major problem with your laptops, right? Computer virus uh, spreads to humans. So be very, very careful. Now I'm going to give you the case of a 70-year-old uh, uh, man. Uh, this patient happens to be my hero, Sir William Osler, born in 1849 and died in 1919, the most famous physician in the English-speaking world at the turn of the 20th century. On September 29 of 1919, he got a cold while returning from Scotland where he'd gone to see an open uh, we'd gone to see a patient. He was riding back in an open uh, carriage. Uh, in October, he developed a bronchopneumonia. Uh, in November, he had classic pneumonia, the type 3 pneumococcus, and the organism now known as Moraxella cataralis were isolated from his sputum. 
And later on, uh, Haemophilus influenzae, so-called Pfeiffer's bacillus, was isolated. By December, he had uh, complications. He had surgery for uh, empyema and lung abscess. The odor of the pus removed was said to be foul. And on December 29, he bled into his empyema cavity and died. Now, can you put all this together in terms of a single scenario? What he had, I would suggest, is a parade of pathogens. Uh, and this model, which is for respiratory infections, follows a lot of different uh, aspects of uh, infectious diseases epidemiology. In infectious diseases, we're accustomed to thinking in terms of Koch's postulates. Who can recite Koch's postulates for me? Excuse me? Excuse me? No, that's something that you can uh, you can isolate from the person in Royce. And then put it back and you can isolate it from a patient, reinfect an animal or perhaps a, a, a person if you can find a volunteer to do it, cause the disease, and then re isolate it, right? So that model, one pathogen, one disease. But frequently things are more complicated than that or they run in a series. And I think what you see in the case of Sir William Osler uh, was a classic, what we would call a parade of pathogens. A viral illness, the cold that he got riding back from Scotland to Oxford on an open carriage, uh, damaged his uh, local uh, immunity, paralyzing his cilia and so on and so forth predisposed to an aerobic bacterial infection. In his case, all three of the organisms here, the pneumococcus, Mophilus influenzae, and Moraxella catarallis were actually isolated using the bacteriology of 1919. And this, in turn, predisposes them for opportunistic infection by anaerobic bacteria, which in his case was clearly present because of The bad smell, the foul odor to the pus that was isolated. We'll go into that by way of review for you. So this happens over time. Viruses, to which few of us have specific uh, immunity, predisposing to an aerobic bacteria and then predisposing to anaerobic infection. And in most infectious diseases scenarios, uh, there are, of course, exceptions. We can see this predisposition. We can see some host uh, parasite uh, interaction uh, that does explain more or less neatly why somebody uh, got this particular disease at this particular time. Now, for the rest of the hour, we're going to talk mainly about uh, certain uh, organisms. What do you see here on this gram stain? Diplo? Diplococci? Anyone else? Well, let's say they're purple. These, uh, the the counterstain, the safranin, is staining these white blood cells red. So these are going back to the FedEx sign that we saw earlier. Is that purple or, or red? I think it's purple. How many think it's purple? Somebody said it's diplococci, but you look at the individual ones, particularly this would be the ghost of a polymorph nuclear leukocyte, which is taking them up into a phagocytic vacuole. What color do you, what, what would you say about this? The dominant morphology or grouping together. Clusters. I would say this is a gram positive cocci in clusters. To be sure, we do have this one here that looks like a diplococcus, but uh, right there. But by and large, they're in clusters. So gram-positive cocci in grape-like clusters. So that is species for staphylococci, right? But again, we see what we look for. We look for what we know. 
And we don't just blurt out that staff, we blurt out gram-positive cocci in clusters or clumps, and that is three keys that we probably didn't with staff. Gram-positive cocci in clumps, distinguished from other staph and different ways. Staphylococcus aureus is a term that we don't use too much in medicine anymore. Um, in clinical medicine, we talk about uh, coagulase-positive staphylococci, the coagulase test, sort of dividing the world of staph into ones that are coagulase-positive and the ones that are coagulase-negative. The gram-positive cocci in clusters in Staphylococcus aureus, old terms look at Staphylococcus aureus, meaning golden yellow colonies on a plate, Staphylococcus albus, meaning white colonies on a plate, which is now essentially synonymous with uh, coagulase negative Staphylococci, especially Staph epidermidis, and then Staphylococcus citrius, or lemon yellow, was a hedge for ones that are sort of in between. But Staph aureus is a term that you'll see in the literature today, Staphylococcus aureus. And Staph uh, is, seems to me to be about, uh, gosh, it must be 50% of the clinical infectious diseases that I'm consulted about today because of the major resurgence of this pathogen for several factors. But staph is ubiquitous, and I'll get consulted from time to time about uh, uh, somebody got staph in the hospital, uh, so let's sue the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, if we cultured you folks, a lot of you would have staph in your noses, correct? Various studies, uh, the range is actually about 6 to 60% commonly said 30% of people have staph in their nose at a given time, with a portion of these people being persistent carriers of staph for uh, molecular reasons. Seems to be genetic. We know that colonization increases the risk of infection. Studies, particularly a large European study, show that if you culture all of you in the room and we isolate your staph and save it, then if you get sick and go in the hospital and develop a staph infection or have an operation and get a wound infection, it, that gummit will be that same staph that you had there all along. So colonization increases the risk of infection. <clears throat> and foreign bodies dramatically increase the risk of infection. It turns out if, if you uh, try to inject staph in the skin, it's fairly hard to produce a boil unless you inject a whole lot of them. But if you put a single suture material in the skin, and then you inject the, uh, the staph, you'll reduce by several logs the number of organisms required uh, to produce a local abscess. Gram positive cocci and clusters, gold pigmentation, coagulase. Let's see, I wanted to go forward there. And the, the overall pathogenesis of staph in a given patient is pretty much summarized here. So frequently in infectious diseases, we see colonization preceding infection. We get infected by the organisms that we already have picked up. There are some exceptions. Can you name some exceptions? Most viral diseases we pick up de novo. What about some of the bacteria? Some infections by particularly virulent organisms. Anthrax, this lamb hits you. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, great example. <coughs> Plague, tularemia, very virulent organisms. But even meningococcal disease, usually you colonize with it before you become infected. So colonization. Uh, then you can get, it can go several routes with staph. Uh, the, the pivotal event is staph getting into your bloodstream. And usually uh, you will slough it off. But it can lead to a metastatic infection somewhere else in the body. Sometimes with a predisposing cause, sometimes without a predisposing cause. We'll go into the model of staphylococcal osteomyelitis, for example or endocarditis, but if you have damaged tissue somewhere, then the organism will zap to set up shop and cause an infection. Foreign bodies predispose to infection. 
And also, of course, staph is notorious for causing skin infections, staph and skin infections, and we'll talk about that a fair amount. So it gets in the blood, and then the organism in recent years has been changing its surface antigens and produces these super antigens, which can lead to the toxic shock syndrome. So that's the general overview of staph infections. And some trends in staph, increasing incidence of hospital-acquired disease, especially with devices, and methicillin-resistant staph now present out in the community. And this is known as commonly as what? MRSA, M-R-S-A, and MRSA is an old MRSA. Uh, uh, it's oxacillin is usually the drug that we actually test for in, in the hospital, not methicillin, but methicillin is sort of looked at as a class drug. And one thing to know about, which may be on your test, it's sort of new out there, is a lot of this community-acquired staphylococci produce the Panton valentin leukocidin. You had that in your micro? This is something fairly new under the sun, but this turns out to be a marker for a lot of these community-acquired MRSA infections, why staph is coming back, and usually this is expressed as a bad skin infection, but this is showing up all over the country, sometimes causing a necrotizing pneumonia in otherwise healthy children. So this is why community-acquired staph is, is, is coming back with the vengeance. It's an exotoxin that damages, as the name suggests, leukocidin, kills polymorphic nuclear leukocytes, uh, induces pores in their uh, membranes, uh, leads to degranulization, re release of inflammatory mediators, and this has been associated, as indicated, with skin abscesses, boils. Your uncle is a fancy name for boil, right? And severe necrotizing pneumonia, the Panton valentin leukocidin factor. This from a recent uh, issue of the New England Journal of Medicine uh, about community-acquired staphylococcus infections. This was the outbreak in the St. Louis Rams football team. And it turns out that they were playing on artificial turf a lot, and they developed a lesion shown here called a turf burn. And, and the interesting thing about this is that here you have the, uh, a, a histogram of the cases, and you see that the main people who, who got the disease were the... Uh, the grunts, right? The uh, offensive linemen. Can, can everyone, can, all, can the women in the class interpret this diagram? The X's and O's. Let's, let's take a look and, and see. Let's take the arrow and, and point. <laughs> We're going to have you point to the quarterback, which is. <laughs> Women who can do that. Okay. We, have, we, have, we have three right here. Starting with Kat. Just, just point, to the, point to the quarterback. Maybe that one? Yeah, that was. <laughs> good, let's give her a hand. That would be the quarterback. So you hear the, the center, the, the offensive guard, and then the, the defensive uh, lineman there. So the thing is that all of these patients had the Pantone Valentin leukocyte factor. And also for the MEC gene, there's a family of MEC genes, MEC genes, that encode for methicillin resistant, which is really broad resistance to the beta-lactam uh, antibiotics. So this is a little correlation with uh, basic science with clinical disease. Any questions about staff before we progress? Um, that, yep. That Right, that particular toxin, the, the pantone, there are other organisms that produce an exotoxin, sometimes called exotoxin A. Pseudomonas, for example, has one, but, but uh, and we'll talk about pseudomonas, but, but uh, the pantone valentine leukocidin factor is, to the very best of my knowledge, uh, specific for staph. Any other questions about staph? What do you see here? This is a fluorescence microscopy. Uh, yes, but uh, why? I mean, let's see. Let's just say it's a, a beaded uh, chain, cocci in chains, right? We can look at the 
kind of the unit one, we can look out here at the ones that are sort of free floating and say it's a coccus, right? But it's in a long chain. Might be a, in another context, a, a gold necklace. Streptococci are a very diverse group of organisms. When people say strep, what do they mean in, in, in the laity? Excuse me? Strep throat, but what organism are they referring to in the laity? Excuse me? Type B? Type A, right. Type A is in personality, right? What, what organism are they talking about? Type group A? Streptococcus pyogenes, correct. When people say strep, they mean strep pyogenes, but that's only one of a whole number of uh, uh, organisms. Uh, we're concerned, just, just a few little facts about strep. Uh, they can be classified a, a, a lot of different ways. They can, on the hemolysis pattern, strep pyogenes is group A beta hemolytic streptococci, right? That is speakies for uh, streptococcus pyogenes, beta hemolytic. And what do we mean by beta hemolytic on a, uh, uh, an agar plate containing sheep red blood cells? Excuse me? It completely lyses them. It's clear, clear hemolysis. Alpha hem hem hemolysis is partial and it's green, right? That's why we, the viridan strep means green. Gamma hemolysis really is no hemolysis, we understand it. The other way is to look at strep, aerobic, anaerobic, and then just grows in a little bit of, of oxygen, microaerophilic. The antigenic components uh, determined in the 1930s by Rebecca Lansfield, group A, so that strep pyogenes is a group A, is an aerobic group A beta hemolytic is the way it's worked out. But of course now with genetic mechanisms in your lifetime, all this is going to be genetic, correct? And and, and, and uh, the speciation will, will differ. So it's, it's strep are sometimes hard to get a handle on. And this just shows the overlap in the common uh, Lance Field typable strains, uh, beta hemolysis, group A, C, and G. Uh, but you can see that with some other organisms and alpha hemolysis, the viridans group, there is some overlap. Uh, sometimes group A, rarely group A strep will lack the beta hemolysis been likened to a rattlesnake without a rattle. The viridan strep, the green streptococci, commonly present whereabouts in your body? Mouth, correct. And do they have names? Lots of different names. Uh, and one of them, for example, that may sure to show up on a national board is streptococcus mutans, which will especially be on the examinations of your counterparts who are in blank school, dental school, right? Because it's a, it may be the most uh, prevalent pathogen in the world as a cause of dental caries. But there are others, a salivarius, mitis, mitior, et cetera, et cetera, which turn out to have unique, fairly unique niches in the mouth. Uh, this can be a, a, a skin contaminant because of you know, putting your hand in your mouth or whatever, or, or licking your, uh, uh, whatever you like to lick, and then touching your skin. Up to half of the blood isolates may be contaminants, therefore, and they can be slippery. Sometimes you can get nutritionally deficient variants which require vitamin B6 to grow, and uh, this may be a cause of negative blood cultures. Seeing right now a patient who may have endocarditis but negative blood culture, so you worry about that. And here's some of the uh, ones to, just to kind of know about briefly. Strep mutans, dental caries. There's several, and I don't think these names are particularly important to you, that cause endocarditis. One of them, which is a slippery organism because its name changes, it's I guess taxonomically slippery, but is now usually known as Streptococcus anginosus. Uh, it has had other names, Streptococcus mg and Streptococcus intermedius. It tends to behave more like a staph and causes abscesses, but in general, 
Group A strep, as we know, strep tend to spread through, t through tissues as opposed to staph, which tend to be localized and, and cause an abscess. And then there's a famous association apt to show up on, on boards and sometimes in life of Streptococcus bovis, implying that it's isolated from cows, which has an associated with, association with colonic tumors and polyps. Villus adenoma is the colon. So that's a case in which uh, the microtech can call up and say, has this patient had a colonoscopy? Lance field groups, some highlights of these Lance field groups. We're going to talk about group A strep, strep pyogenes, with the syndromes that it causes. Pharyngitis, sore throat, scarlet fever, group A strep. Not seen as much now as it used to be, but was a, a common severe pediatric infection with death. Cellulitis, which is sort of a puzzling term. What is cellulitis? Anybody know? Excuse me? What? Uh, yeah, it's the skin mainly. It's a, not so much deep connective tissue, but in skin. It's a spreading, a superficial spreading infection of skin. We're going to talk about that. And then recently, it's, it causes glomerular nephritis and rheumatic fever, two immunologic manifestations, we believe. And then recently, with these new strains that are out there, the flesh-eating bacteria strain, right, fasciitis, and toxic shock syndrome. Group B strep, neonatology, newborn infants and mothers. I guess the way I might remember that if I was a second year medical student would be group B, it's a boy. Just occurred to me. <laughs> you all make up little mnemonics like that. Good, that's better, B, baby. It's a lot better, thank you. Thank you. Group D, yes, we might say, uh, doggone it, carcinoma of the colon. <laughs> Streptococcus bovis. And then there are others that we sometimes see in medicine, C, uh, F, and G. So Streptococcus pyogenes, the bad one, uh, it'll show up a lot in a classic exam question is why doesn't a, an attack of strep throat give you immunity? And the answer is, there's so many types, right? So efforts have been made to find the common antigens. Can everybody see okay with the lighting here? There's so many different M proteins which are located on these fimbriae, which is the first thing that the cell sees. Facultative anaerobes, most of the organisms that we see, which are considered aerobic bacteria, are, of course, facultative anaerobes, meaning that they can't, they'd rather have oxygen, but they can grow anaerobically. There are a few strict aerobes that we'll look at, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which require oxygen. Most are facultative. It's called group A because it's sensitive to the to bacitracin, trace in the A disc. Lance field groupable, when we say a strep is A, B, C, D, or whatever, it has sufficient C polysaccharide to be typed. There are other ways to look at them as well. Uh, one thing to know about, and scarlet fever is caused by a, a, an erythrogenic, which means red forming, right, toxin. Made as a it, result of a sick strep, a strep that's been in turn infected by a virus, a bacteriophage. We look uh, classically at uh, uh, the antistreptolysin O titer, for example, to, for diagnosis. They also make other things, nucleases, extracellular enzymes, and it turns out that for serologic diagnosis of streptococcal impetigo, skin infections, antibodies to DNA B may be useful. Streptokinase allows the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin, and this has been taken advantage of clinically as a clot buster. This is one of the original clot busters, the thrombolytic therapy. If you roll in with a heart attack or a pulmonary embolus, there are, of course, others. And hyaluronidase, which, which uh, breaks hyaluronic acid. The M protein, discovered by uh, Rebecca Lansfield, 
And in addition to being allowing the strep to be typed, it allows the organism to resist phagocytosis in the absence of type-specific neutralizing antibodies, at least 85 different types. And the appearance of antibodies correlates with the elimination of strep pharyngitis. And the issue comes up whether antibiotics treatment shortens the duration of strep throat. The answer seems to be it probably does a little bit, but strep throats usually resolve on their own. And this is just uh, streptococci showing these fimbriae. Reminds me very much of a, of a live uh, sand dollar. When you pull up a live sand dollar when you're wait, waiting in the surf, see these little hairy projections on the outside fimbriae. So you can see very well how that would stick like Velcro to your mucosa. Threat pyogenes, uh, this is a sort of a pathogenesis slide that I sort of put together. And the, uh, I just marvel at the diversity of these organisms and the strategies that they've evolved. Enzymes causing local invasion, pharyngitis, et cetera. Bacteremia with metastatic spread, osteomyelitis. The antigen that expresses the presence of antibodies leads to immune complexes, which explain post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, a classic example of an immune complex disease. And also, antibodies seem to explain rheumatic fever with cross-reactivity to different tissues. And then the super antigens that we've identified recently causing this massive cytokine release from lymphocytes leading to streptococcal toxic shock syndrome and other things. What's your diagnosis here? 39-year-old truck driver with a sensory loss in the right leg, a patient I saw at Providence Hospital last year, who uh, Previously, it had a, uh, he has a, a, an entity here. Uh, well, let's see if anybody knows what he's got. He's got these uh, nodules on his skin, and he's also got this, this one here is uh, this, this little oval here that you see, this hyperpigment in the upper right panel is, uh, is, a, is like a, a congenital, uh, shall we say, patch of darkening the skin. It's called a cafe or lay spot. So what's he got? Excuse me? You've had that in pathology? No? Yeah, this, is guy, this guy has got von Recklinghausen's neurofibromatosis. So a complication of that, he developed a, uh, a, uh, a, a neurofibrosarcoma, or fibrosarcoma, that required surgery, leaving him anesthetic in his leg. Comes in with cellulitis with bullae, hypotension, renal failure, low platelet count. He's got these bullous lesions, in this area of cellulitis. It looks nasty here. And he's very sick. He has necrotizing fasciitis with the toxic strep syndrome. Because he had the anesthesia in his leg, he got strep infection and it wasn't caught early enough and uh, he develops this lesion. So that's the way to put him all together. Answers strep, streptococcal toxic shock syndrome as blood cultures were positive for strep. Enterococci live where? Gut, right? Enterococci, pneumococci, lung. This is not hard, but if you've studied Latin, enterococci gut. And in clinical medicine, enterococcus fecalis is the main one, but enterococcus fecium tends to cause a lot of resistance. Enterococci, living as they do in the gut, we're used to them, and they're not usually major pathogens, except in the opportunistic setting. And as we see, they're important mainly for causing endocarditis and also urinary infections, but also they can cause, as part of the flora, synergistic infections in other settings. And a major concern is the development of resistance to antibiotics, which began in Europe, where a drug like uh, uh, vancomycin called, uh, called parvomycin was being used liberally in animal food to help the animals grow big and to resistance develop. Any questions about strep or enterococci? We pass now to anaerobic infections, and you've had a separate lecture on anaerobes, correct? 
So this will be by way of, re of review. We look at anaerobes, uh, strict anaerobes, require reduced oxygen tension. Microaerophilic organisms can grow in 10% carbon dioxide in the air, but grow best in the presence of a small amount of oxygen. Facultative anaerobes grow better in the presence or absence of air. And the, the key point of this slide is how we live among anaerobic bacteria. This shows the ratio of anaerobes to aerobes in the gingival crevices, which is why flossing is important. In the stool, 1,000 to 1. Female genital tract, 10 to 1. And, and these are very diverse organisms, a lot of which, uh, probably most of which, have not yet even been speciated, up to 500 in the stool alone. And some principles of anaerobic infection, these are common, often overlooked, often polymicrobial, defies Koch's postulates, and have lots of different bacteria, typically from contamination or extension from your own flora. And there's a complicated interaction involving synergism and antagonism among species. And the next slide just shows three slides go over the oxidation reduction potential, which you've had, correct? It's important to uh, maintain a positive value for your oxidation reduction uh, potential because interruption of the capillary blood flow causes the value to become negative. Example, surgery, trauma, ischemia, tumors with tissue necrosis. So surgery becomes very important in anaerobic infections. The breeding tissue, removing the foreign body, draining pus, eliminating obstruction, etc. And this is a short course in anatomy for those of you going into psychiatry. <laughs> all, all you need to know. The point being that the insides of our bodies is pretty sterile, but that we do have these parts that are exposed to the rest of Richland County, right? And the issue is that if you do something foolish or have something done to you, and you breach these epithelial barriers, then you're set up to have anaerobic infections. And this was brought home to me one day in Sunday school when we were studying Psalms, and the preacher said, my wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. What does that mean to you? And I raised my hand and said, that's clearly the first published example of an anaerobic bacterial infection. <laughs> guy had gotten in fights or whatever, and he developed uh, an anaerobic infection with a bad wound. He had done something shown here, right? There's a wonderful experimental model that, that uh, in a lot of infectious disease literature is based on models of pathogenesis to simulate fecal peritonitis. What you do is you take the contents of, a, of, a, of the stool mix it with barium and put it in a gelatin capsule, then just make a tiny slit in the abdomen of a rat, and drop the capsule in, sew it up. This is a model then of what would happen if you perforated your bowel. The natural history during the first four days, about half of the rats died from uh, septicemia, usually E. coli with peritonitis. After seven days, all the survivors get abscesses mainly due to anaerobic bacteria. So this just shows the model here with the cumulative mortality, and uh, they don't die with the abscesses, at least not initially. They'll eventually become malnourished, of course. But then you can modify that in different ways. And there are uh, a number of anaerobes to just kind of remember. The peptostreptococci are looked at as anaerobic strep. We'll talk a lot about clostridia, or an example of one organism causing one disease, Koch's postulates. Bacteroides fragilis, the premier anaerobe of what part of the bowel, of the, excuse me, what part of the body? The gut, right? Then, for extra credit, Prevotella, Porphyromonas, Fusobacteria, a gram negative tooth, toothpick, et cetera. In the mouth, we're just going to look at it uh, very briefly uh, Bfrage, anaerobic strep, Apeptostreptococci, Fusobacteria and Prevotella melanogenicus in the gut, Bfrage becomes supreme, but a lot of us have Clostridia in our guts and other organisms, and one of the Clostridia, Clostridium, okay. excuse me? A, a, a real problem pathogen today is Clostridium 
difficile, right? We'll talk about that. And female genital tract, a lot of anaerobes as well. These are, you have to trust my word for it, gram positive. They're purple. This would be Clostridia. These are little, they look like Chinese letters. These are diphtheroids. This is uh, now Prevotella melanogenicus, so called because it forms black pigment on agar. Bacteroides fragilis, a pleomorphic gram negative uh, bacillus. These are fusobacteria, so called because they're spindle shaped, gram negative. Here's another fusobacterium, fusobacterium nucleatum, gram negative toothpick. And to get a culture for anaerobes, uh, obviously you don't want to get anything that's exposed to the rest of Richland County. You don't want to swab a wound, or get stuff that's been coughed up through the mouth, et cetera, et cetera. You want to get uh, a specimen that's clean, a blood culture, culture from an incision and drainage procedure through unbroken skin. The key thing here, when to suspect an anaerobic infection, when, the, when it's got a bad smell, it turns out that only about half of uh, anaerobic infections have this really bad smell, this fecal-like smell. Smell can be so strong, you don't want to be in the room. Uh, but that's diagnostic, or as we say, pathognomonic for an anaerobic infection. Infection near a mucosal surface, necrotic tissue with gangrene, gas in the tissues, failure to grow pathogens despite multiple bacteria on the gram stains. I want to say, close with just a little bit, since we're going to be talking about syndromes in these lectures, about clinical reasoning, and several ways that we can make diagnoses. Uh, one is to look at the pattern that we see. And the word syndrome comes from the Latin and the Greek. I can't remember which. From, I think it's from the Greek. From things running together, association, right? Certain things put together. This is the syndrome of X. We use, we think in terms of probabilities. Optimally, we think also in terms of pathophysiology, what's going on. And we speak of, if you've had this yet, soon, we speak of sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity briefly means positive in disease, specificity negative in health. The positive predictive value, then the likelihood that a person with a positive test has the disease. The negative predictive value, the likelihood that a person with a negative test does not have the disease. And all that should be by way of review. Uh, also coming into play is something called Bayes' theorem. If you had this, Bayes' theorem is from probability theory. Bayes was an English clergyman who was interested in uh, card games. And he worked out a lot of probability theory and uh, why things that, uh, when you get into the math of it, things oftentimes don't seem to be what you think intuitively. For example, the... Uh, the birthday game is a probability theory. Do you know that one? If I take 30 people in this part of the room, and I'm going to make a bet with Jared here, right, that uh, two of these people have got the same birthday. He says, great, I'll take you up on that, uh, even odds. And he figures 30 into 365 is about one, odds of 12 to 1 in his favor, right? The, the odds are 7 out of 10 that two out of 30 people have the same birthday. And you have to work it out to understand it. And <laughs> Bayes' theorem states that, uh, as applied to testing, that the likelihood that a, that a test is going to be a positive result is false positive is a function of the pretest probability. We take this graph here. On the vertical axis, we have the likelihood that a screening test result is positive is false positive rather than true positive, going from 0 to 100. On the, on the horizontal, or x-axis, we have the prevalence of the disease in the population being tested from 0 to 100. So obviously, at the bottom right here, if everybody in the disease, excuse me, everybody in the population that you're testing has the disease, then all positive results are true positive. None of them are false positive. On the other hand, if nobody in the population has a disease, then all positive test results are false positive up at 100. But the interesting thing is that in between, whereas intuitively you would say this relationship would be a straight line relationship, right? In between, it's this uh, parabolic curve. 
So that what it says is that as disease population is a as the prevalence becomes very low, the likelihood that it's false positive, even for a very good test, becomes very high. And this is an argument against just taking everybody in this room and doing HIV antibody testing on you, because a few of you, uh, one, or, one or two of you, might have funny antibodies and test positive repeatedly when you don't have the disease. So I'm going to stop there now and uh, let that be the end of the show.